So we're talking about JUnit 5, deep dive into JUnit 5. <coughs> My name is Sam Brennan. So I'm a Spring and Java consultant at a company called SwiftMine here in, in Zurich. And I've been a Java developer for over 17 years, so quite a long time in that area. Um, in terms of Spring, I've been a core committer for Spring since uh, 2007. And actually, my original work there was uh, rewriting the testing framework based on, on JUnit 4 and TestNG, so all the annotation-driven stuff, in case you've done any integration testing with Spring. And I still maintain that. So that's actually how I got pulled into the, the JUnit side here. <coughs> Obviously, I'm a speaker at conferences. I'm also a trainer and coach. And uh, the reason I'm really here to talk today is that I've been a core committer for JUnit 5 since last, uh, well, since October 2015. So very quickly, just about our company here in, in Zurich. We specialize in uh, Spring, Spring Portfolio, um, obviously uh, JUnit and, and testing, right? Um, but also Java EE in general, software architecture, code reviews, and that kind of stuff. If you need some assistance, feel free to contact us. You'll find us here in Zurich and online. So the agenda today, <coughs> we're going to start off talking about um, impetus for change, why we even have a new version of JUnit. Uh, then we'll look at JUnit 5 in, in detail, as much as we can over the course of an hour. And I'll briefly talk about some of the, the support in Spring 5 for uh, JUnit 5. And then if we have time, be here for questions and answers. And if, uh, if not, you can, you can find me outside and we can talk later on. So first up, <coughs> show of hands. Don't know if I can see anything. So uh, who tests? Right? Everybody, t all right, good. <coughs> who uses JUnit? Yep, anyone use uh, something like TestNG? Few people, so most people JUnit. Is there anyone that thinks JUnit 4 is is perfect as is? No, no reason to change. Is there anyone who's uh, ever want, wished for uh, JUnit 4 to be more extensible, maybe or something like that? Few people. Okay. Another curiosity: who, Who's on uh, Java 8 already? Good, good. Okay. So most people here. It's nice to see. So first up, um, why a new version of, of JUnit? JUnit 4 was released uh, a decade ago, over a decade ago, and uh, a lot has changed since then. Um, specifically, testing needs have, have matured, right? People don't just write small unit tests. People started writing integration tests, system integration tests, all sorts of things like that. And so our expectations of what a testing framework can do, um, those have grown over the years, right? So I, I tell people um, JUnit is actually a horrible name simply because the word uh, unit is, is baked into it. And obviously, uh, originally it was about unit testing, but now we do a lot more things, right? You know, in-memory databases, uh, Epson 2P servers, FTP servers, all this kind of stuff. So we do full-blown integration testing with JUnit, but the name stays the same. Um, but yeah, it does more than, than just unit testing. <coughs> Another thing about um, JUnit 4 was the, uh, the kind of the architecture and the modularity. Um, there was, in fact, just uh, one, one module, so you could kind of call it um, a big ball of mud. Right, there's just the JUnit jar, the one thing, and that made it difficult for the JUnit team to um, change things and also for people to um, analyze or work on smaller parts. Another topic was um, test discovery and execution. So those are tightly coupled in, in JUnit 4 with uh, the concept of runners, and it's harder to um, add in different support or have any kind of extensibility due to the, the architecture of JUnit 4. And extensibility, that's an area of my expertise, right? So I wrote the integration um, with JUnit 3.8 in Spring and also with JUnit 4, and I've done it in, in JUnit 5 now as well. And in JUnit 4, the, um, lots of room for improvement there. I mean, we'll talk about the runners and, and rules, um, but it wasn't easy to always co combine different third-party libraries like maybe like Mokito and, and uh, Parameterize Runner in Spring and stuff like that. And let's not forget... Java 8, right? So JUnit 4 is still based on, on Java 5, so not taking advantage of any features from 6, 7, or 8, and especially with 8, you know, things like uh, default methods and interfaces and functional interfaces, lambda expressions, and stuff like that. So who's actually, who knows that there's a runner API in JUnit 4? Yeah. And how many people have used something like the parameterized runner? Yeah, maybe the, the spring runner, a few people, Mokito runner, something like that. Okay, so you realize that you're not forced with JUnit 4 just to use the core JUnit 4 functionality. There's this, this runner API. It's, it's very powerful. Um, in fact, it can do anything, but that's because it's responsible for doing everything. And the biggest drawback with runners is that you can't combine them. You can only have 
one. Now, I have seen some teams who came up with some kind of composite runner where they tried to get two working at the same time, but um, it really wasn't baked in or supported by the framework itself. So one very common example you see online, people asking questions over the years, I want to use parameterized tests, but I want to use the spring runner, and how do I do it? And the answer has always been, no, you couldn't do it with runners, just, just wasn't possible. So then um, a few years in, the JN4 team came up with uh, rules, and you can read the, the title a few different ways. There's kind of a, a pun built into that, right? So you could say JN4 rules, like it's awesome, or you could say rules are meant to be broken, or JN4 rules are meant to be broken, and I would say in some ways they, they always were. So in JNIT 4.7, uh, the team introduced a method rule that you could configure with um, at rule annotation. And in 4.9, they introduced a test rule trying to improve on the method rule um, that you could use at the class level and at the method level. But then they realized that, uh, and then they deprecated the original one, and then they realized, well, okay, people actually still need that. And the problem was they didn't think about the big picture and coming up with a generic solution from the start. So there's kind of like three ways to have extensions in, in JNIT 4. Um, these are great for, for simple use cases, right? So like a temporary folder or a timeout or something like that. Um, and you can even combine them. You can create like a, a chain of them if you want. But a single rule um, can't be used for both method level and class level callbacks. So uh, case in point, the um, spring class rule and spring method rule that I, that I implemented in uh, spring's testing framework, uh, it was impossible, unfortunately, to have one rule, right? We had one runner that you could use, but when you want to use rules, you said, well, because of the architecture of JNF4, you have to have two, and that just makes it kind of annoying for the, for the user. So basically, copy and paste to get that working. Um, the other thing is uh, the zero support for instance level callbacks. So instance level would be support for things like um, dependency injection, either from like Mokito injecting a mock or something like Spring or Juice uh, injecting a bean into your test, right? So there's no support in that in JNF4 with rules. Um, you had to kind of fake it, and that's what I did with uh, Spring's rule testing support. So <coughs> in came Jane at Lambda, called Lambda just because of Lambda Expressions, kind of like the next generation. We had a, um, a crowdfunding campaign that was initiated by um, Johannes Link and Mark Philipp in, in Germany back in 2015, um, later joined by uh, two other Germans, Matthias Meredith and Stefan Bechtold, and uh, yours truly here. The only uh, non-German on the team, but everyone speaks German, so it's seems to be overrun by Germans or German-speaking people. And we have a, a new member since about uh, three weeks uh, and the core team is a committer, and he's also German, so um, I don't know. It's just, I think Germans like to test. <laughs> or at least they like to participate and, and help with JNN. Um, so that, that campaign ran from uh, July through October 2015. We raised almost 54,000 euros um, from 700, uh, 474 individuals and, and lots of companies. Um, and four companies also do, uh, donated six weeks of developer time. So this was a super boost. We had lots of productivity in the, um, the prototyping phase and, and the, the alpha phase. And as you can imagine, after the funds died out, production kind of dropped off a bit. Um, but if your name's on here as an individual, there are actually a lot of people in Switzerland. You see some Swiss companies uh, listed up here as well. Uh, if you contributed, then thank you very much. Much appreciated. Helped us to get off the ground and get running. So we had a kickoff meeting back in uh, October 2015 with uh, the core developers. Um, again, some of them supported by, the, by their companies. And we also had um, some other members of the community. So we had um, Oliver Gierke from, from Pivotal. You might know him from uh, Spring Data, Spring Data JPA. He just became a Java champion, I think, last week. Um, we had a guy there from American Express. And another thing we did is uh, we invited um, developers from tooling support, right? So we invited somebody from, from Gradle, someone from Eclipse, someone from IntelliJ. And they came and gave us their input, right? Because if JUnit works well as a framework, but it's not working in any of the tools, if it's not supported there, then um, no one's going to adopt it, right? So from the start, we wanted to make sure that we were on the right track so that the tools could also uh, support it. So that brings us to JUnit 5 after that kickoff. Uh, the roadmap, we developed a prototype uh, from October to December 2015. And then we worked on an alpha, um, basically rewriting a lot of the stuff from our learnings in the prototype, released that in February 2016. Then we um, had our first uh, real milestone um, back in July of last year, uh, followed quickly with some bug fixes with M2. And then we put out M3 last November. We're currently working on, on M4. That's a couple of weeks to maybe a month away, something like that. And then we hope to have another milestone to follow that, then a release candidate, and then we hope to actually hopefully be able to release sometime this year, tentatively scheduled for uh, the third quarter this year, depending on, on resources and bug reports and stuff like that. 
Um, there are, however, people that are already using it. That's always nice. Um, some people even and use it in production. They, they trust it enough. And we use JUnit 5 to test JUnit 5, so it's, it's definitely getting uh, battle tested already. JUnit 5 in a nutshell, what is it? Um, it's modular, or at least we like to think it's modular. You'll see uh, in a diagram in a bit that we at least have several modules. Um, it's extensible. That's one of the main focuses um, for me personally. That's one of the reasons that I was basically invited to the team because of my experience with Spring. Uh, Spring's testing support is very modular and extensible. Um, you can have 30-part extensions to that. And so I've taken some of my learnings from there and, and helped um, kind of guide the extension model for, for JNF5. Um, modern, at least we like to think it's modern. At the very least, it uses Java 8, and we do make use of streams and, and uh, Lambda expressions internally. We also allow uh, Lambda expressions um, and streams to be used in, in testing as well. Another thing we say is that it's uh, forward and backward compatible at the same time. Might sound a bit strange, so let me try and explain that. So um, one of the things we realized, right, is that there are already people out there using JUnit 3 sometimes, right? Um, definitely, you know, millions of people using JUnit 4, and we want people to be able to use um, JUnit 4 and JUnit 5 at the same time. But we know that the tooling support um, isn't going to be on board immediately, so people are going to be able to want to run JUnit 5 tests on JUnit 4, and then once the tooling support goes to JUnit 5, they're going to want to be able to still run the JUnit 4 tests, but on, on JUnit 5. So these are some issues we had to, to deal with to come up with some forward and backwards compatibility. So basically, um, we have what's called the JUnit platform, and it supports already out of the box running JUnit 3.8, JUnit 4, and JUnit 5 tests at the same time. And new, fr uh, new testing frameworks can be run um, with the JUnit 4 infrastructure. So you can do that now in your IDE, for example, if it doesn't support uh, JUnit 5. And the way you do that, <coughs> we have a, um, a runner we've written for JUnit 4. And you say at run with JUnit platform, and that allows you to run stuff like uh, JUnit Jupyter, the new testing uh, framework, or some other framework that's based on, on the new infrastructure in JUnit 5. So what is JUnit 5? At first, we started off calling <coughs> all of it JUnit 5, but then we realized um, that's probably not the best way to go. And after some long debates and input from lots of people in the community, we came up with um, a way to split it all up. And for starters, we have um, a new core platform that we call the JUnit platform. That's going to be released as version 1.0. And that's the foundation for launching uh, any kind of testing framework on the JVM, so not even limited to the JUnit testing framework. So there's already some frameworks out there um, written in, in Scala and Groovy and Kotlin, for example, um, that are building on the same base platform that the JUnit 5 programming model builds on as well. So that has at its core um, launcher and, and test engine APIs. Um, we have a console launcher so you can run it from the command line, a Gradle plugin and Maven Surefire, uh, Surefire provider that we've uh, written. Talk more about that in a bit more later on. So the new programming model is not called JUnit 5 on its own. It's actually called JUnit Jupyter. And the reason is we didn't want to tie it to a number like with JUnit 4. Um, because we don't know the next release might be uh, version 6, but it might be still the same programming model. It would make sense to have a name, something like, like Jupiter. And Jupiter happens to be the, the fifth planet from the sun, in case you're wondering about that. And it starts with a J and a U. There you go. So that is the new programming model and the new extension model for JUnit 5. Then we have what we call JUnit Vintage. Um, I originally proposed Legacy, but that didn't go over too well, so we ended up going with, uh, with Vintage. So everything before JUnit 5, we call Vintage, and that's support for uh, JUnit 3 and JUnit 4 for running them on this new platform. So this uh, Launch API, in case you're interested in the details, um, it's used by the IDEs and build tools to actually launch the framework. And it's a central API for discovering and executing um, tests via one or more engines. So the engines are kind of like what runners were back in JUnit 4. And to uh, tell it what to run, there's a request object you can build up with a, a builder API. Um, you can select things, like you can select classes, you can select packages to, to scan for classes in. So we have class path scanning, like you might have seen from, from Spring, for example, with its uh, component scanning. Uh, filters, so you can filter based on like tags, like include these tests, exclude these tests, stuff like that. And the feedback is provided via a, a listener API. If you're familiar with Spring, um, there's also a test execution listener API in Spring, but it's quite different from this one, so don't get confused if you're importing those there in your IDE. Yep, and there's this console launcher again for uh, running from the command line. And uh, recently we added some nice cool ASCII art tree output with colors and stuff like that, so it looks pretty, pretty cool and pretty modern if you run it that way. Test Engine API, again, kind of like the runner from before, um, but more generic. So a test engine is responsible for two things, for discovering tests, like 
finding them in the class path, seeing if it has the annotations it supports, and then also later on for executing them. But these are in, in different phases. And that's for a particular program model. So like the one for uh, Jane and Jupiter just supports the Jane and Jupiter test. And the other one for the vintage stuff, it understands the Jane and 4 test. And that means that you can have Jane at 5 test, Jane and Jupiter, and Jane at 4 all running in the same test suite. You can even have stuff from uh, Kotlin spec or um, spec C, another framework as well. All the stuff running at the same time and have all the test results aggregated together. So these things are registered using um, Java's standard service loader mechanism. Just add the right stuff to your, um, to your jar, and it'll get picked up automatically. And as I mentioned, yet we have the Jupyter test engine and, and the vintage test engine out of the box from us. And you can implement your own. So this is kind of the, the big picture. We see we have um, the platform in, in the middle, right? So that's all the, the core um, features there. And then building on that, we have individual testing frameworks. The ones from the JNIT team are, of course, the, the vintage uh, engine we have there and the new Jupyter engine. And then you can also have some kind of um, third-party libraries implementing their own engine. Um, as I mentioned, there's one called Spexy out there that's listed up on the upper right. Um, it already uses this as well. So the IDEs and build tools uh, rely on the platform. They don't even um, have to know about which engines are present, which is quite nice. right? So the idea is that new testing frameworks can come along um, right to the APIs of the platform and then have the IDEs and build tools automatically support them without knowing about these new programming models and new testing frameworks. So if you're writing an old test, you program against uh, vintage stuff, new test, Jupyter, and then other frameworks. And behind the scenes, um, this is what I meant by it being modular, right? So in the past, again, JNU4 was just the one jar. Well, you see quite a few jars and modules here. So within the, uh, the platform itself, we have these uh, the engine API and launcher APIs, um, and then we have the platform Runner, we have the support for um, Maven and, and Gradle down there as well. And then you see um, the top part. So for Jupyter, the, even the API and the implementation are separated. So the API is what you program against as a developer. It has the annotations in it that you need in the extensions. But the actual implementation of how things are, are run is implemented in an engine. And that makes possible to support stuff like, like JNU4 quite easily. So the JNU4 jar stays the same. You keep uh, um, programming against that. And then we have this JNU Vintage engine here within this yellow box that knows how to uh, discover those tests and, and run them. So that's the big picture. <coughs> in terms of ID, um, IDs and build tools and, and adoption, um, IntelliJ was uh, the first. So since IntelliJ 2016.2, um, they have official support for um, various milestones of, of JNU5, JNU Jupiter. Works quite nicely. Um, Eclipse also has beta support since uh, 4.7 M3, but um, since we are releasing 5.0 GA for JNIT after 4.7 goes out, they have uh, informed us that the official support won't go in until 4.8, but you can actually try it out with some of the milestones for 4.7, and that also works quite nicely. NetBeans, I honestly have no idea. Um, Gradle, so uh, again, we, we came up with our own interim solution for that. We have a plugin. It's not the best in the world because none of us are Gradle experts and none of us had ever written a Gradle uh, extension or plugin before. Um, but you can use it. People use it. And we use it in our own build. And the idea is that eventually that will get um, taken over by the Gradle team. There's some issues already in the Gradle issue tracker to track that and, and deal with that later. And if you want to know how to use it, it's a document in the user guide. We also have some example projects. <coughs> in terms of Maven, um, we also have a provider for that, but that has recently, in the past couple of weeks, actually already been taken over by the Maven Surefire team. So we're happy to see that support going to the official Maven Surefire team. Hopefully they'll take it to new heights. <coughs> so moving on to um, Jupyter, the um, extension model. We have an extension uh, interface. It's just a marker interface. And uh, all the extension APIs are defined in this one package. So um, when you start importing, we started with uh, org.jnit, just like jnit4. But everything in Jupyter is in a Jupyter sub package. And again, it's more modular and hopefully uh, easier to find stuff. Just be wary of, of what you're importing in your IDEs. Um, one of the great things about the extension model is that you can implement as many of these extension APIs as you want in one particular one. So if you look at Springs, for example, um, it implements about uh, 10 of these uh, extension APIs in one thing. So you can combine and match um, as you need. And again, that wasn't really possible to do something like that with JNU4. In JNU4, we had the at run with to select a runner. And in JNU Jupyter, we have an at extend with annotation that allows you to select one or more extensions. And you can combine multiple at the same time, right? So you're not limited to just one. 
You can define that on, on an interface, on a class, or um, at, at the method level, if uh, the extension can be only applied at, at the method level, for example. Um, also, one thing about um, being on Java 8, right, so we can have default um, methods in, in interfaces, and we can have basically uh, test interfaces with uh, test methods in them already implemented, uh, with extensions already configured and stuff like that. So new possibilities with Java 8 there. And you can also um, put extend with on a, on a meta annotation. So who, who knows what meta annotations are? One person, okay. So uh, in Java, there's no such thing as inheritance with annotations. So uh, if you wanna have something like inheritance, you annotate the declaration of an annotation with another annotation. And the one on top is called a meta annotation. So you can come up with your own custom annotations. We'll see that later on. Um, this is a feature widely known um, in Spring, if you're familiar with that. And we added this in uh, JNIT Jupyter support. So uh, this is a term my colleague coined indentation art. Um, actually, it's implemented like this in, the, in the, the code. If you look in the code base, I turned off formatting and indented all the stuff so we could see how it all works on our own. But um, we have several callbacks, so several APIs for um, lifecycle management of your tests. Um, so we have before all, which is like before class JNIT4, and then nested inside that we have the instance level before each and then after each. And we have another level, <coughs> more fine-grained, immediately before and immediately after um, a test method is executed. That's the before test execution callback and the after text execution callback. Another feature um, you might have seen in, in some frameworks, uh, some kind of conditional execution. Um, some of these ideas are borrowed from, uh, from Spring and Spring Boot with conditional beans and stuff like that. Or maybe you know about profiles with Spring. So uh, JNIT4 has the add ignore annotation, right? And uh, when I went to implement uh, this support in, in JNIT5, um, I decided that we need to make it uh, generic so that everyone else in the world can benefit from this and come up with their own ways to enable or disable tests. So we've done that at the container level, which would be a test class, and at the test um, level, which would be a, a test method. So you have fine grained support, and you can implement your own conditional test execution. Um, for these instance level things, again, something like um, the Mokito extension uses or the Spring extension uses to perform dependency injection, uh, you can do that with a test instance post-processor. And uh, we have another feature for um, parameter resolvers. So in JNIT4, you couldn't have any uh, parameters in your methods, test methods, but with JNIT Jupyter, you can have parameters in your test methods. Um, you can even have parameters in your constructor. And third-party APIs can, can tie into that, they can hook into that, and they can provide uh, the values that are injected into your methods and stuff like that, and we'll see that in action later on. So that's also borrowed from uh, Spring, if you're familiar with Spring MVC, and uh, like request mapping methods that take various uh, parameter arguments. The last one is for handling exceptions. Uh, there's a dedicated API just for that. So you can either um, ha swallow an expected exception or um, log one, et cetera. In terms of the programming model, everything is in the new org JNIT Jupyter API package. So that's again what you're gonna program against when you're writing your tests. Um, that's where all the annotations and meta annotations are, assertions and assumptions, um, support for custom display names, which we didn't have um, in JNIT4, but you might have seen in something like the Spock framework. Uh, visibility, so uh, things don't have to be public anymore. We, we removed that rule in JNIT Jupyter, so your test methods and classes no longer have to be public. Tagging is a new feature, so there was kind of um, categories, an experimental feature in JNIT4, but we have official, official support for, for tags in JNIT Jupyter, so you can tag methods or, or classes, and then when you um, have the test engine started up, you can say include these tags or exclude these tags, stuff like that. Talked about the conditional test execution, penis injection, right, and land expressions, I mentioned you can use those in uh, certain places in, in assertions and dynamic tests and as well these interface default method support. So again, you can pre-implement some of your tests in an interface and then uh, implement that interface from different classes and then kind of you know, inherit this default behavior. Uh, and you can also do that for things like your um, before each methods and stuff as well. Nested test classes, that's something um, brand new. There are some custom runners out there in JNIT4 that allows you to do that. Um, it's basically a way to have um, classes nested inside another test class um, just for basic structural reasons. And dynamic tests, so that's uh, an easy way to use lambda expressions and, and streams and stuff like that to on the fly generate uh, tests that you don't know about in advance. So maybe you have a data set and you want to generate some tests on the fly, and they get run like, like normal tests, they're, but they're little lambda expressions. So they're somewhat comparable to parameterized tests. They're not quite the same. They're a bit more dynamic in that sense. In terms of annotations, 
We have an at test annotation. I know you're probably all surprised. Um, we couldn't come up with a better name, so we, we stuck with that. But again, it's in a different package. Um, we also have a test factory that's for dynamic tests. And if you're um, implementing your own test engine, there's also a testable annotation you would want to look into. So instead of um, before class and, and after class, like in JNet4, we have before all and after all, because we have a, a different abstraction there about containers. Um, and then instead of before and after, we have before each and after each. So there's map one to one. If you want to um, configure a custom display name, you just use the at display name annotation, um, at tag for tags, and at disabled is the new version of at ignore. And again, the reason is because we have the support for conditions, and conditions are either um, enabled or disabled. That's why at ignore maps on to disabled, and at nested for tested classes. So um, assertions. We debated, um, should we have our own assertion library, right? Um, there's already good ones out there. In the end, we decided to uh, implement a very basic set. This is in org.j and Jupyter API assertions class, so not the assert class anymore, but assertions. Limited set of core assertions. You get your basic stuff like assert equals and assert not null, um, the ones you're familiar with from, from Jane at 4. Um, but we also have things like assert throws. So if you have an expected exception, um, and anywhere I have this little blue lambda, that means you're allowed to use Lambda expressions there, or method references. So you can um, assert that a bit of code throws an exception, and you can get back that exception and then perform assertions on that, right? Like the cause or the, or the message and stuff like that. So it's a bit cleaner than uh, some of the ways you had to do it in JNU4. For, for um, timeouts, um, instead of having that via a rule or annotation like in JNU4, we also do that um, with something like we call an assertion timeout or assert timeout preemptively. So the first one, um, just runs the code in the same thread, and it's not going to preemptively kill the, the code if it runs too long. Um, but you could alternately uh, use assert timeout preemptively. That'll start it in a new thread, and both, both of these take lambda expressions for the bit of code you want to run and make sure it doesn't run too long. Assert all, um, very cool feature, actually. Uh, it's similar to the notion of soft assertions, if you're familiar with assert J. So um, there are probably times where you've written a test and you had maybe five or six assertions, and you changed some code and you ran the test and the first one failed and you went and changed stuff and then you ran your test again and then the second assertion failed and right, you kind of got annoyed going back and forth. It would be nice to be able to know all, all six are going to fail or which ones aren't. So with assert all, you can provide each of the individual assertions kind of in a group of assertions uh, as lambda expressions and JUnit will um, execute all of them and track all the exceptions and then throw them all wrapped in one, one exception. That's pretty cool. One thing that's um, different, so uh, you'll notice pretty, pretty immediately, if you have a message for a failure, that now comes at the end of the list, so it's now like expected actual and then the message. And another thing we support is um, lambda expressions for the message. So you can have um, your failure messages uh, lazily evaluated. So you want your tests to run as fast as possible, um, but when they fail, maybe you want to provide a lot of context, you know, building up um, a large string, uh, maybe lots of information, but you don't want those strings to be concatenated and built um, when your tests are successful. So you can just have a supplier of string implemented as a lambda expression to have that easily evaluated. And of course, if you need more power, um, don't blame us. You're free to go use uh, another assertion framework, so something like assertj, hamcrest, etc. Those also work perfectly well with Jupyter, just like with JNU4. So now we'll see. If I can live code up here. While standing, and if the demo gods are with me. So we'll see. So I'm not using the... Um, beta version of uh, Eclipse, so I don't have the built-in support to run a test on its own, so I'm going to cheat and use the JUnit4 integration. I'm going to say run with JUnit platform, and this allows me to run JUnit Jupyter tests with the JUnit4 infrastructure on, on an older version of, of an IDE. So in here, we can start off by saying test. Don't pick the one from org JUnit, right? That's JUnit4. We want to pick the Jane and Jupiter one, and that's probably not horribly exciting, but the thing we see here is this doesn't have to be public, so just less the type. And if we run it, it should hopefully work just fine. 
And what we're seeing here um, won't be quite the same in, uh, in IntelliJ or in um, future versions of, of JNet, but um, when we run the tests like this with the JNet4 infrastructure, we actually see the engines listed first. So the Vintage engine is there, there just weren't any tests discovered. The JNet Jupyter engine is there, and it found my test class and my test method, and that works as expected. So nothing too shocking there. Cert equals, if we pull those from the, hopefully this is from the right package, right? Yes, the JNet Jupyter API assertions. Cert equals uh, for, nothing exciting here, two times two. Run that, that should still pass. And what I was saying about the messages is they now come at the end and you can optionally implement that as a, a Lambda expression. My very, very complex failure message. So the point here is that if this ends up being something uh, robust and dynamic and taking a long time to build, if the assertion passes, then JUnit doesn't even try to evaluate it, but otherwise it would lazily evaluate it. So that runs fine, and now if I say three, then it should evaluate my Lambda expression and then build up the string. So that's kind of a nice feature there. What else did I wanna show? Assert all, yep, so that's a, a nice one. So let's say we have uh, this one and uh, the one that didn't fail. And put the failing one first, right? So the old use case is, right, you run it and the first one failed, but we didn't get to the second one. Maybe we wanna know if they all work. And the way we can do that, we can say assert all. And then that expects um, executables. And these are just Lambda expressions. So you can say like, that points to something, points to another one, I'm copying and pasting here. So you just have a common separated list of, of uh, Lambda expressions and you want to assert all of them. You know, is that big enough? Can people see that? Okay. So this is what I was saying, hope that doesn't reformat everything. If I run this now, it will uh, tell you here multiple failures. This one expected for it was six, and if I had an uh, additional failure in there and run the test again, we'll see that it actually lists, can I zoom in on that? Yeah. Right? So you see it collects all of the exceptions there and you can view each of them in the results. That's quite a, quite a nice feature. Saves you time from going back and forth when you're asserting multiple things within a given test method. Mm -hmm. Right, and assert throws. Let's try that one out. Assert throws, this is a, again, um, Lambda expression, so expected type. I'll just say one time exception dot class. That's what I expect it to throw. And my executable is going to be some code that I have in my service layer, for example, that uh, throws an exception. Oops. Boom. So what's going on here? Do not like that. Seems happier now. No? Semicolon. Okay. So there we have, again, this would probably be some, some method in your, your service layer, and we'll even, oh, can I extract that? My ID doesn't like me. Forget it. <laughs> okay, so if I run that, uh, let's uh, fix this. Let's also be two and two. Right, so that passes. And if you wanted to get a hold of that, uh, you could assign that to a variable exception, right? And then you could even, you know, assert something else. Assert equals. And you could say, uh, expect it to say, boom, right? And you could say, exception dot get message, right? So then you have the ability to, to test and perform assertions on the exception afterwards. And um, assert timeout, similar to this, right? A similar structure. You pass in a Lambda expression for some code that you want to execute within a given timeout. 
Okay. What happened there? Good, okay. So, the display name, we can get that later. Um, assumptions, we also have support for that. That's something you might have seen in JNet4. So there are times um, when you want to say, I want to assume this is true before I continue. For example, um, to, to abort the test mid-flight, maybe you um, only want to run that test on the CI server, or maybe you only want to run a particular um, test um, when you're running on, on Windows, or maybe only on Mac, something like that. Right, so we have this assume true and assume false, um, like there's in JNet4, but we also support um, Boolean suppliers and suppliers of strings, um, so you can use Lambda expressions and method references for that on JNet Jupyter. And there's another one that's kind of like um, sophisticated if block. Uh, you could say assuming that um, some condition is true, then execute this, uh, this little block of code provided via Lambda expression. So I will skip that for the sake of time. Um, we have one nice thing in the, the reference manual, um, we have lots of, lots of demos, and all of those demos actually come from real code. So we build the reference manual, uh, the user guide for J and Jupyter, um, based on all these examples, and that's in a documentation project. So any of the stuff you want to check them out, the search and demo, you can go look at the code yourself, and it all, it all runs. So assuming true, and I was saying there's this, like, assuming that um, we're on the CI server, then perform this code, and otherwise don't. Uh, so it's kind of like an advanced if statement, and then perform some additional uh, assertions if you wish to. How are we doing on time? Good. How much? Okay. So um, test names, um, by default, based on Java syntax, but you can use at display name to uh, have something uh, dynamic. So I should be able to show that really quickly. Display name, and Right, so you can have something more advanced like that, and we see that it will actually get displayed here in, in, the, in the test results as well. Um, you could also pick, um, whoops, what's going on here? An emoji, if I can copy and paste that, we'll see. Yes, and who thinks this will show up? It doesn't show up in IntelliJ, but in Eclipse, uh, we get a nice little emoji in the test. So that's always everyone's favorite feature. And now we have to move on for the sake of time a bit quickly. Um, so dependency injection, this is one of the places where the extension model meets the programming model. Using these parameter resolvers, APIs, you can implement your own. Um, and more than likely, you use something from like Mosquito, uh, Mo Mosquito, Mokito, or, or Spring. Um, and not just for test methods, but also for constructors or your before each methods and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. So use cases implement uh, injecting something like the URL to the server, a port number, something like that, data source, or even an application context in, in Spring. Test info, um, that's a way to have a kind of reporting or be able to interact with reporting from your tests. So you can have a test info object injected uh, straight into your test method. Uh, there's a resolver in the background uh, that does that. And I can probably demo that very quickly. So with the method, Test info, you can get access to it. I'm not going to do anything too exciting here. I'm just going to print it out just to see that it's working. So I should have something in the console read. And we see this is the uh, test info. So we get the name, right? Whether or not there are any tags configured for that, uh, the test method, the test class, this kind of stuff. So you can access things about the current test programmatically via the test info, or you could implement something like that on your own as well. Tagging, <coughs> you just declare at tag on a test interface class or method, like this, at tag fast. And then you could um, say when you start, only run the fast tests, only run the slow tests, smoke tests, stuff like that. Another option is to have a custom tag where you declare at tag as a meta annotation, right? So here we have this custom annotation we've written called fast, annotated itself with tag fast. Then we can just use this at fast annotation. And we can even go one step further, um, having a custom composed annotation. Um, and we just, what we do there is we can uh, do what we did before, have at tag fast, but we can also combine that with other annotations um, from JUnit and also um, from Spring that works very nicely. So now we have this uh, fast test annotation and we can just declare that. Um, so people are already doing that in some of their projects with stuff like integration test, smoke test, things like that. 
conditional test execution, again, another place where the extension model meets the, the program model with those uh, APIs. At disabled is actually um, an implementation of this. If you want to see how that works, you can check out the source code for disabled condition. Um, and you can deactivate them all uh, if you want via a, um, a system property. So you can say basically um, run all the tests that are currently annotated with that disabled because I want to see if they're still broken, right? Something like that. Default methods. So I mentioned that we support those and this introduces a new concept that I like to call um, test interfaces or you might consider it to be something like um, a testing trait if you're familiar with that from other languages. Um, things are supported there um, at before each and after each at test, test factory for dynamic tests, tags, extensions, these kinds of things, you can implement those in your test interfaces. And we have an example in, in the user guide. So I'm not going to spend time on that. I just encourage you to check that out in the, in the user guide. Um, nested test classes, again, this is a way to have a logical, hierarchical grouping of test classes other than is allowed for you or supported for you with um, package structures in, in Java. Um, and they have shared initialization and state. So the outer instances, you can access, obviously, um, that information since it's a, an inner class. And you just declare at nested on the, the inner classes inside your top level, and you can have multiple levels of nested tests. So you can combine um, these with test interfaces as well, um, opening up some, some new possibilities. So we have this testing a stack example in the user guide. and. I might be able to find that one really quickly. Testing a stack demo. If I run this, it does not work because, yeah, sorry about that. Don't have the beta support in, in, in uh, Eclipse here, but I can fake that by doing something like this. Has to be public because JNU4 requires that. And now if I run it, we should see something quite different that you've never maybe seen before. So using custom display names, and we see we have nested uh, tests within a nested test class here. So a cool feature you might find uh, useful. Some people from uh, BDD really like that kind of stuff. Dynamic tests. So for that, um, instead of having a regular test method, uh, you have um, a dynamic test or one or more that are registered at runtime as Lambda expressions, like in a, by returning a stream or a collection of these and you annotate one of these methods with at test factory. So again, this is somewhat analogous to parameterized tests, um, except that you are actually generating the, the code on your own. And as for a demo, I will also take the one that we already have and just show some examples of what that might look like. So one of them is failing, that's fine, it was expected. Um, the current ID support doesn't understand that dynamic stuff, so they show up as unrooted. In the future, they won't. Um, here we see lots of dynamic tests that were just generated on the fly. And the way that looks in the code is you say something like, like this. You say you return a collection of dynamic tests, and then you can create like a list on your own, dynamic tests, providing the names, and then providing the code that you want to execute. And so you could create this list, for example, from your own custom data set from some um, data provider that you have on your own. What's missing? Um, the dynamic tests don't get the full support for lifecycle callbacks that regular test methods do, and we're looking to see if we can uh, fix that or make that better. Um, official support for parameterized tests isn't there yet, but uh, it's uh, in a branch right now and should be coming out in Milestone 4. Um, scenario tests, uh, something similar to what you'd have in, in test in G, um, where you can have multiple steps that uh, depend on each other. We're considering adding that into the, the core as well. And also things like um, parallel execution. We don't have support for that yet, even though it was in, in JNU4, so we're looking at ways to do that. Um, now I'm running out of time. I'm just going to fly through this stuff right here, and if you need any, have any questions at the end, just, just come ask me. So again, uh, Spring has support for, for JNU Jupyter since uh, 5.0 M1, and M5 is coming out today, I believe. That already supports all of the core uh, integration testing support from, from Spring. Um, and in addition, it also supports uh, dependency injection into your tests, into the constructors and the methods using Spring's annotations like at autowired, at qualifier, et cetera. And you can also use um, spell expressions for conditional test execution. Um, it does uh, work with uh, Spring 4.3 and uh, my custom project here, Spring Test JUnit 5, if you want to play around with that on, on Spring 4.3 before upgrading to Spring 5.0. And the way that would uh, look, there's a Spring extension for that. You just say add extend with Spring extension. Um, we have some uh, simpler convenience annotations at Spring JNIT config, which combines things like at context configuration, 
plus the registration of the Spring extension and something similar for uh, the web support in Spring. Um, really cool things, really powerful, this at enabled if and at dis disabled if. So I said at disabled is in uh, Jane and Jupyter, um, but we have these two in Spring that allow you to access beans in your application context to decide if you want to run or to execute a little spell expression um, to access uh, maybe the date or the time or the, the server name or stuff like that. So you can do really cool dynamic stuff um, just write an annotation to say uh, disable these tests or, or don't. And I will skip that for now. Um, at Nabon on Mac, I might be able to show that one really quickly. They're not here. Yes. Okay. So this is what I say. We have this at enabled if annotation. And you can provide it a spell expression. You can access things like system properties. And you can basically say check if it's on a Mac. You can do something similar for, for Windows and stuff like that. And that's the power of um, using Jane and Jupyter plus Spring support kind of combined. So it kind of opens up new opportunities. And we'll see where the community goes, what, what you all come up with that you can do there dynamically. Um, Spring Boot also works quite nicely with um, JNet5 um, with some custom config. I have an example project online called Spring Events where I combine uh, Spring uh, Boot 1.4, their um, Spring Boot test annotation, their auto configuration for the mock MVC testing web apps with Spring, and the new Spring extension. I combine it like that into to one annotation. And then I can just basically uh, use that so I can have a test like this. This actually works, uh, much less code, much less configuration than you would have seen in the past. So again, taking Spring 5, Spring Boot, and, and Jane and Jupyter. One annotation to say, I want all that. You can auto-wire in the, the mock MVC created by Spring Boot into your test method, and then just use it locally, have custom display names, all sorts of stuff. So all, all sorts of new features coming to play together. And in closing, um, check out jnet.org slash jnet5. We have um, what we think quite nice user guide, working on it all the time, but lots of documentation there, lots of examples. Um, Javadocs online as well. You can find us on, on GitHub. Two projects, right, for the main code is jnet5 for some of these sample projects, jnet5 samples. And if you have questions, uh, please ask them on Stack Overflow with the jnet5 tag. And Spring references, just start at spring.io, and you can find all that stuff as well. Is there any time left? One minute. Is there a question that takes less than a minute? I don't know. I don't see anything. Doesn't appear so. Okay. Well, then, thanks for your time. Hope you enjoy it. Going out, you can use Devotee Machine to leave your feedback. Thank you.